Nobody talks about the Weaver Psychiatric Center. Nestled away in the fog, kissed mountains. It's the place troubled kids disappear into, never to be seen the same way again. When my supervisor offered me a position there, all she said was, it'll be a challenge. Evelyn, something you've never experienced before. That was the understatement of the century. My first case is a boy named Ethan. 10 years old, mop of unruly brown hair, eyes wide with a terror that makes him seem far younger. His parents dropped him off three days ago, ranting about night terrors, imaginary friends, and some chilling nonsense about the shadows coming alive. The file is disturbing. Single child, homeschooled, isolated. Detailed sketches of elongated figures, impossible proportions, and too many teeth. Ethan was bright, articulate. The decline is swift, terrifying. His words melt into gibberish. The fear is raw and visceral. Doctors assume early, onset psychosis, but his parents are convinced it's something. Do you want to be in here, Ethan? I ask, voice gentle in the stark white room. The boy is huddled in the corner, bony knees drawn to his chest. He stares at the far wall, eyes flitting over emptiness. A faint, almost inaudible whisper leaves his lips. They said I'd be safe here. Who said that, Ethan? His shoulders rise in a helpless shrug. My clinical side is screaming at me. Auditory hallucinations, potential schizophrenia, but there's something in his eyes, a desperate clarity that makes my skin crawl. Maybe this isn't a break with reality. Maybe this isn't a break with reality. Maybe something has gotten inside his head, twisting his world. The session is a whirlwind of half-finished sentences and whispered warnings. Something about shapes in the dark, a deal he made, the feeling of being constantly watched. When I try to coax him away from the wall, he curls tighter, whimpering. The light, he murmurs. It keeps them back, just a little. At first, I think it's just childish fear of the dark. But then he turns his head, his shadowed eyes locking with mine, and I see it. The air ripples around him. Shadows thicken, swirling like smoke. And within that shifting darkness, shapes begin to coalesce. Not the crayon monsters of his drawings, but elongated silhouettes. Skeletal hands, limbs impossibly long coiling toward the ceiling. For a heartbeat, time itself seems to stutter. I blink, and they're gone, just the bare walls, the clinical lights above, and a terrified little boy clutching my hand so tightly that his knuckles turn white. Are you okay, Dr. Hart? Ethan's voice is a hesitant tremor. I clear my throat, trying to dispel the chill prickling at my spine. I, I'm fine, Ethan. But I'm not, because I saw them too. And they're coming for him. After Ethan, nothing feels the same. The clinical white of the hallway appears sickly, the air too thin. I swallow back a wave of nausea, trying to push down the remembered sensation of tendrils of shadow brushing against my skin. The rest of the day is a blur. Detached, I go through the motions of interviews and assessments kids barely out of toddlerhood, babbling word salads or staring at the air with vacant eyes. Their parents watch me, desperation clinging to them like a shroud, and I see my failure reflected in their faces. I'm supposed to have answers. I don't. Dr. Hart. A word? Head snapping up from a chart, I find the director standing just outside my office. Tall, painfully thin, always impeccably dressed, she looks like a corporate executive who accidentally wandered into a horror movie. Of course, Director Ross. I manage a polite smile that feels brittle on my lips. She doesn't smile back. How are you adjusting? That's coded language. Everyone at Weaver knows Ethan was a disaster. No textbook psychology tricks could reach him. I ended up relying on sedatives just to keep him from screaming himself hoarse. Instead of admitting defeat, I lie. It's a slow process. Ethan's case is exceptional. 
The director narrows her eyes, but then nods slightly. Indeed. Come, let's walk. We follow the sterile corridor, our footsteps echoing harshly. I risk a question. Where are we going? To see something. Her voice is non-committal. Unease churns in the pit of my stomach. Despite the bright fluorescent lights, there's a dimness at the end of the hall, a section where the shadows seem deeper. It's there she leads me, her stride purposeful. At a steel door, she produces an ID card, swiping it with a practiced hand. The lock disengages with a clunk, and she gestures me inside. The room is different, less clinical, more industrial. Concrete floor, a single observation window, thick chains bolted to the walls, and a girl. She's no older than 13. Skin sallow, emaciated, body shivering beneath a rough gray blanket. Her eyes, ringed by purple bruises, track the ceiling, whispering something under her breath. Maya, the director says, tone sharp. The girl twitches, then slowly turns her head toward me. Her lips continue moving, the constant murmur barely louder than the buzzing of the lights overhead. This, the director states with icy calm, is what happens when an entity takes over completely. My breath catches. I've heard the term before, whispered between staff like a ghost story. An entity, not a ghost or a monster, but something that latches onto a vulnerable mind. I always thought it was a clinical euphemism, a way to talk about the unexplainable. But looking at Maya, I realize it's horrifyingly literal. The muttering cuts off abruptly. Maya's eyes, impossibly wide, pupils almost swallowing the iris, lock onto mine. She sees you, Director Ross, continues. They all do, eventually. They see those who watch them. I rip my gaze away from Maya. This is, what's going to happen to Ethan? The director hesitates. Something flickerings behind her mask, like composure. Ethan's case was unusual. We won't let it go that far again. The coldness in her words offers little comfort. Weaver isn't about helping these children. It's about containment. That night, I lie awake in my two, quiet apartment, staring at the ceiling fan's hypnotic spin. My dreams are infested with shadows. Whispers slither into my ears, a language I don't understand. But the promises are clear. Power, knowledge, escape. Every time I close my eyes, I see Ethan's terrified face, Maya's chillingly empty stare. I can't stay at Weaver, not and keep my sanity. Yet some perverse, stubborn part of me rebels at the idea of leaving while these children suffer. Maybe there's a way to fight back. After all, I saw the shadows, felt the wrongness of the entity twisting Ethan's mind. Perhaps there's a sliver of that terrible reality I can grasp, a pattern to uncover. It's a desperate hope, a dangerous gamble, but the alternative is to walk away, to leave those children to a fate worse than nightmares. The following morning, I find myself walking not toward my office, but back down the shadowed corridor where Maya's cell-like room waits. It's a reckless instinct, but something about her vacant stare haunts me, a chilling emptiness that suggests a terrible truth. Entities don't destroy minds. They reshape them. You shouldn't be here, Dr. Hart. Director Ross materializes from the gloom, her normally crisp voice laced with disapproval. I brace myself. I need to see Maya again. For what purpose? The girl is beyond your help. There might be something. A trace of her left inside, I insist, hating how shaky my voice sounds. There has to be a reason the entity chose her. Something specific, not just random vulnerability. The director scrutinizes me for a long moment, then sighs. Very well. The room feels colder now, the shadows clinging to the corners like cobwebs. Maya rocks back and forth on the floor, her whisper rising and falling in a hypnotic rhythm. 
When I approach, she tilts her head, as if studying a strange insect. Maya? I'm Dr. Hart. Do you remember me? No response. Just the ceaseless murmur of words I can't parse. It feels like standing on the edge of a cliff. The wind howling some alien language that promises to drive me insane if I listen too closely. Maya, what were you like before? I press. Desperation overriding caution. Your drawings. Your dreams. What did you care about? Slowly, her whispering ceases. Eyes focused somewhere over my shoulder. She speaks. There was a tree. In the forest behind our house, I would climb. So high. I could touch the sun. Her voice is high, chai-like, a jarring contrast against her gaunt appearance. A memory surfaces. Maya's file mentioned an old, gnarled oak tree drawn over and over in her sketchbooks. The branches, I say gently. How did they feel? Rough. Safe. Like a secret place. Safe. I echo. Some jagged piece clicking into place. The change is horrifyingly swift. Maya convulses, her whispered words snapping into guttural snarls. The lights overhead flicker, buzzing with angry static. No, the screech that erupts from Maya's mouth isn't human. It sounds like something with far too many teeth. The door bursts open, Director Ross flanked by two orderlies. They wrestle Maya down, a blur of thin limbs and unnatural strength. Injecting a sedative, her struggles weaken, the snarls melting back into whimpers. I clutch at the observation window, my breath fogging the glass. That wasn't Maya anymore, just a puppet for something monstrous. Get her out of here, the director says clinically. As they drag Maya's limp form away, Director Ross turns on me, her fury barely contained. This is exactly why patients are to be observed at a distance. You lack the necessary detachment. My jaw tightens. That girl was in pain, and it wasn't her own. It isn't your job to empathize, Dr. Hart, the director snaps. Your job is to analyze, categorize, and if all else fails, isolate the threat. Sentimentality will get you, and your patients, killed. She strides out, leaving me in the shadows. It takes every ounce of willpower not to run after her, to shout my defiance. Because I know now, as surely as if the entity itself had whispered the secret in my ear. What I saw in the room with Ethan wasn't the disease. It was a symptom. The entities don't just twist minds. They feed on them. Fear, longing, despair. These are the nutrients the shadows thrive on, and if left unchecked, they consume their host completely. I have access to case files, decades of meticulously documented suffering. Each story is unique, yet the pattern remains. Isolation, obsession, spiraling terror. Every child at Weaver is a meticulously laid feast. The entity in Ethan, it offered him a deal. Protection from the shadows in exchange for something else. Maya's yearning for the safety of her tree. It was a weakness the entity latched onto. But they're sloppy. They leave behind psychic residue, an echo of what was used to break the child's defenses. And that's my weapon. There doesn't have to be a choice between walking away or becoming as cold as the director. I may not be able to save everyone, but perhaps I can save some. The rules at Weaver change overnight. Suddenly, it's not just sterile observation rooms. I'm given full access to the case files, encouraged to explore the facility. Security protocols bend around me, doors previously locked swing open at my approach. There's a wariness in the staff, in the director's narrowed gaze. I'm both weapon and ticking time bomb, granted access because I might, just might, be the key to unraveling the entities. Days bleed into nights. I pour over the files, a tapestry of nightmares woven across the decades. 
Some narratives are chillingly matter of fact. A boy's obsession with astronomy mutating into the belief that the stars spoke to him, revealing unspeakable cosmic horrors. Others are fragments of poetry, final journal entries filled with whispers that promised sweet oblivion. And always, two patterns emerge. An obsession, the entity twists, and a desperate loneliness that echoes my own aching heart. These kids don't need textbook psychology. They need a friend. My first experiment is a girl named Lily, nine years old, withdrawn, haunted by the echoing tick-tock of an invisible clock she insists follows her everywhere. Her case notes are littered with the phrase auditory hallucinations. I see something different, a frantic bid for control amidst a life spinning out of her grasp. Why don't we play a game, Lily? I offer, sitting cross-legged on the faded carpet of her room. This room isn't like Maya's cold cell. It's softer, stuffed animals, posters of pop stars too sugary. Scuffed animals, posters of pop stars too sugary. Wheat for the weaver aesthetic. A calculated attempt at normalcy. Her haunted eyes focus on me warily. What kind of game? A timing game. I hold up a worn stopwatch. When I say go, you close your eyes and then tell me when you think a minute has passed. We can see how close you get. Lily hesitates, then nods, some flicker of childish curiosity winning out. She screws her eyes shut, tiny fists clenched. Ready, go. There's silence, broken only by the insistent tick talk amplified in her own head. My chest tightens as the seconds stretch out. I know what the entity is doing, exploiting her fear of time passing, twisting the seconds into eternity. I want to yell at her to open her eyes, but I learned from Ethan, confrontation makes it stronger. Instead, I count silently along with her. 50 seconds, 55. Okay, Lily's voice bursts out, filled with triumph. She blinks, staring at the stopwatch. I hold up. Fifty. Eight seconds. I was close. You were, I agree. Relief washing over me. It's a tiny victory, but a victory nonetheless. Let's try again. Maybe you can get even closer. Hours slip by. Each time the tick-tock begins to overwhelm her. I'm there with distractions. More games, requests to draw pictures, rambling stories I concoct on the spot. The entity fights back. Her drawings morph into swirling clock faces. My stories twist into sinister ticking countdowns. But Lily fights too. Laughter bubbles from her lips when I juggle her stuffed toys. The trembling of her hand lessens as she colors. The entity might feed off the bad. But I'm betting on a deeper human truth. Hope is more stubborn. When the session ends, Lily is exhausted but smiling. At the door, she hesitates. Dr. Hart, you, you're not afraid of it, are you? The question hangs heavy in the air. Sometimes, I admit, because lying seems more cruel, but what matters is I'm here to help you fight it. Her eyes widen, something kindling behind the fear, maybe, at long last, someone believes her. Leaving. My footsteps echo in the sterile hallway. The director watches me from the shadows, an unreadable expression on her face. There will be consequences, she murmurs. I know, I reply. And there's a new edge to my voice. She may command the facility, but in those patient rooms, the shadows and I battle for a different kind of control. It's a power game now, and I won't back down. The next day brings news of a breakthrough. Of sorts. Ethan, usually listless and withdrawn, has become agitated. He screams about the shadows, scribbling frantic warnings about a deal breaker. The nurses think it's his psychosis worsening, but I see the entity's claws, grasping desperately amidst the turmoil I'm causing. Each success comes at a cost. 
Shadows swirl across my path as I walk Weaver's halls. Nightmares bleed into reality, the insistent whispers growing clearer. Sleep becomes a battlefield, the director's steely warnings echoing alongside the entity's insidious promises. The war for my own sanity has begun. Victory at Weaver feels less like triumph and more like a borrowed hour. Lily isn't cured. Each day remains a battleground, her laughter a fragile shield against the ever, present tick. Tuck that haunts her, but it's enough. She's fighting back, and the entity is on the defensive. Ethan is a different story. His newfound agitation is a double-edged sword. The shadows thrash against his mind, desperate to regain control. Yet their frenzied movements expose weak points, glimpses of the terrible bargain they struck. I spend hours poring over his frenzied scribbles, the director's disapproval a constant hum in the background. You're pushing him too far, she warns, the usual clinical detachment in her voice laced with something that might be concerned. Or perhaps it's just a calculation of how much use I am before I break completely. He's getting stronger, I counter, holding up a page where beneath the wild ranting, a single phrase repeats with chilling clarity. You lied. They promised protection. They lied. The director's gaze sharpens. Promises are their currency, Dr. Hart, and lies are their mother tongue. It's not the rebuke I expect. For a fleeting moment, I see a flicker of something beneath her icy facade. Wariness, perhaps, or is it fear? A knock interrupts us. Nurse Jensen enters, a whirlwind of nervous energy. Dr. Hart, it's, well, I thought you should see this. She leads me down the corridor, not toward the patient wing, but a forgotten corner of the facility. A disused supply closet has been transformed. The shelves cleared, the single dim bulb casting an eerie glow over a site that makes my blood run cold. The walls are a tapestry of swirling charcoal. At first glance, it seems like childish vandalism, but there's a horrifying familiarity in the elongated figures, the clusters of eyes, the gaping, toothy maws. Ethan's drawings, magnified, replicated with a frantic intensity that speaks of a mind on the verge of collapse. He got out of his room last night, Nurse Jensen murmurs, her voice shaking. We. And in this act of desperate rebellion, there's another terrifying truth. Ethan is not just a victim. He's becoming a weapon the entity wields blindly, and we're all in the line of fire. The news spreads through Weaver like a virus. I'm a pariah, and a prophetess in one. Staff members who once pitied my naivete now view me with a grim respect. Some, fueled by fear, demand the children be completely sedated, locked away until their minds are mush. I fight back with cold fury, arguing that containment alone is what the entities want. Broken minds they can slip into unnoticed. We can't surrender. The director surprises me by taking my side. Maybe she sees the tactical advantage, or maybe, on some level, she still believes this is a war we can actually win. The rules change again. I'm given my own team, Young psychologists, researchers, a few grizzled veterans who haven't forgotten. There are people beneath the case numbers. My makeshift ward is filled with laughter, crayon drawings taped to sterile walls, a defiant act of normality in this place haunted by shadows. Our weapons are meager, games, shared stories, an unwavering refusal to let these children feel alone. It's laughably insufficient against an enemy that exists beyond our comprehension. Yet, something extraordinary begins to happen. The entities thrash, their manifestations becoming clumsier. A flickering light bulb reveals not just shadows, but the panicked writhing of a monstrous form desperately seeking purchase on a mind that no longer completely belongs to it. The whispers grow more insistent but there's an underlying note of desperation. 
we're disrupting the feeding. One night, as a storm rages outside Weaver, the air crackles with an energy that sends a shiver down my spine. It's coming from Maya's cell. When I arrive, two orderlies stand guard, their faces etched with unease. The director said not to disturb her, one mumbles. You can tell the director to find me when she wants to explain this, I snap, pushing past them. Inside, Maya is a whirlwind of motion. Her whispers have escalated to a shriek, a discordant melody of nonsensical words that claw at my sanity. The shadows writhe across the walls, and for the first time, I see a face coalescing in the darkness. Bulbous eyes, a gaping maw, a flash of something insect, like and predatory. The orderlies make a move to intervene, but I shout them back. I learned with Ethan, aggression fuels them. Right now, Maya isn't the battleground. She's just collateral damage. It's lying, Maya screams, a flicker of her old self shining through the madness. It said it would protect me. I know. I step closer, ignoring the instinctive urge to flee. I focus not on the monstrous shape, but on the girl trapped within. I know they lie, Maya. Slowly, her movements become less erratic. Her shrieks fade into ragged gasps. Exhaustion. Yes, but there's also a chilling calculation in the entities now. Focused gaze. For the first time, it acknowledges me not just as a watcher, but a threat. The storm outside intensifies, lightning painting monstrous shapes across the walls for a fleeting second. And then it blinks out of existence vanished. Maya collapses, sobbing. As I rush to her side, I realize the true significance of what I've just witnessed. It wasn't driven out of her. It retreated. The implications are bone-chilling. The entities are adapting, learning from our successes just as we try to learn from them. We've poked a sleeping dragon, and now it's wide awake and angry. In the aftermath, the director is uncharacteristically silent. When she finally speaks, it's in her office, late at night, the relentless rain outside mirroring my own bleak mood. You've bought us time, she admits gruffly, the closest thing to praise I'll ever get. But we need more than that, Dr. Hart. We need a way to strike back. Her gaze flickers to the darkened window, to the shadows that seem to press insistently against the glass. We both know they're in there, watching us, waiting for a weakness to exploit. It may already be too late. Weaver transforms. It's no longer just a hospital, but a fortress veiled in clinical sterility. The laughter in my ward feels defiant, a candle flame against the encroaching storm. We're buying time, Yet every hour brings the feeling of a tightening noose. The breakthrough comes, as these things often do, from an unexpected corner. It's a new patient, a boy named Alex, barely 10 years old, with eyes that hold an ancient wariness. He doesn't rage like Ethan or whimper like Maiba. He analyzes. They come from the gaps, he whispers one day, as we build a pillow fort, a ridiculous, but necessary defense against the unseen, the places between places. A chill runs down my spine. Not the metaphorical gaps of the mind I was trained for, but something more literal. That night, I'm granted access to Weaver's most secret archives. The case is deemed too insane even for this place. I find them, stories of children vanished into thin air of physics, defying shadows seeping from walls of a patient who carved a swirling symbol on his skin and was never seen again. They thought it was madness, but what if it was truth? The next day, I break every protocol Weaver has. I bring Alex to the room where Ethan made those frantic charcoal drawings. His eyes widen as he traces the monstrous shapes on the wall. This. It's like a map of their home, he murmurs. His finger lands on a single repeating symbol, the door. The implications are staggering and terrifying. 
If Alex is right, then these entities, they don't just exist in the mind. They have a source, a terrible dimension they crawl out from. And maybe, just maybe, there's a way to force the door shut. The director is first furious, then fascinated. Weaver becomes a place of dual purpose. My team battling to protect fragile minds while a hand-picked group of physicists, historians, and even the odd occultists work alongside us, seeking the key to that unseen door. It's a gamble born of desperation. The more we prod, the harder the entities fight back. Sleep is a luxury I can no longer afford. The whispers grow louder, offering escape knowledge, a sickening echo of the original temptation that ensnared these children. Some nights, I wake to find my own hands covered in frantic scribbles, the swirling symbol replicating itself under my skin. The line between obsession and infection blurs. My team looks at me with the same fearful concern they once showed the patients. They're not wrong. I'm on the knife's edge, teetering. And then we find it. A hidden text, ancient and barely decipherable, describing a ritual, a plea to some forgotten power for protection against those who walk in shadow. It's a long shot, maddeningly vague, but it's all we hate. The night we enact the ritual is pure controlled chaos. The room is a tangle of wires, monitoring equipment, and the hastily drawn chalk symbols prescribed by the ancient text. Alex sits at the center, eyes closed, a beacon of vulnerable humanity. My team huddles around him, a shield of defiance. I pace the chalk circle, chanting the translated verses, my voice hoarse. The air crackles. Shadows converge on Alex, shifting into forms more monstrous than ever. Claws, fangs, eyes that burn with alien intelligence. The physicist's instruments go wild, readings spiking impossibly high. But Alex doesn't scream. He's perfectly still, a strange serenity radiating from him. The attack intensifies. I choke back a cry as a shadow. Claw slices my arm, not an illusion but something that leaves a burning, bleeding gash. Another team member collapses, the air around them shimmering with an awful wrongness. We're losing. Then, Alex opens his eyes, and they aren't his eyes anymore. They burn with cold, silver light, not human, but not monstrous either. Enough, his voice booms, an impossible sound from such a small child. The swirling symbol on the floor flares blindingly bright. The entities shriek, a cacophony that sets my teeth on edge. The shadows twist, writhe, fighting against a force that yanks them backward as if sucked down a cosmic drain. One by one, they snap back into invisibility, the room suddenly sterile and silent. My ears ring, heart thundering. Alex collapses the light fading from his eyes. It's done. The silence is broken by tentative applause. The director stands in the doorway, a mix of grim satisfaction and something bordering on awe on her pale face. You did it, Dr. Hart, she says, and it's the closest I'll ever get to a compliment. You saved him. You might have saved us all. But the victory feels bittersweet. In the aftermath, the cost becomes clear. Alex is different, changed by whatever power channeled through him. Two of my team are hospitalized, their minds wounded by the encounter. And me, I bear the scars, the whispered promises now laced with fury. The entities are repulsed, not defeated. They lick their wounds in the shadows, and I know they wait. It was never going to be one battle, but a war. Weaver changes again. Children still arrive, seeking shelter, and we give what solace we can. But the facility hums with a new purpose. We analyze what traces of the entities remain, study the ritual, search desperately for a stronger weapon. I walk the halls at night, and the shadows seem a little less hungry, a little more wary. In the rooms where children sleep, the air feels less oppressive. It's a tentative peace. And every day, 
I hold my breath, waiting for it to shatter. The question of leaving, of escaping the madness, doesn't even arise anymore. This is my battlefield now. I'm forever changed, touched by the darkness I fight, yet fueled by a stubborn, defiant human hope. The director finds me on the roof one night, the wind whipping at our coats, the distant mountains etched against a starlit sky. I thought you might be here, she says, her usual terseness softened by exhaustion. You can't sleep either. She offers a wry half-smile, not while the monsters are still out there. A comfortable silence falls. Then she speaks, her voice quiet. Was it worth it, Dr. Hart? The cost? I look at the stars, those pinpricks of light against the vast darkness. They were children, I say simply. How could it not be? We stand side, by side, neither hero nor villain anymore, just two soldiers on the front lines of an unseen war, ready to face whatever the shadows bring next. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.